First of all, I have a confession to make. Sometimes all these honors and accolades can backfire on you. Recently, New York Magazine had a contest. Who are the 100 smartest people in New York? So I'm proud to say I made the list. I'm officially one of New York's 100 smartest people. However, in all fairness, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> and next year, they tell me that Lady Gaga is going to push me off the list entirely. Now today, I'm going to predict the future. I've interviewed over 300 of the world's top scientists for the Discovery Channel, BBC, the Science Channel. So let me quote now from that great philosopher of the Western world, Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra once said, quote, prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> and Yogi Berra also said about the future, on the road to the future, if you encounter a fork in the road, then be sure to take it. <laughs> well, I'm a physicist. And you may say to yourself, what does a physicist have to do with money and artificial intelligence? Well, we physicists like to invent things. We invented the transistor. We invented the laser. We wrote the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web was written by theoretical physicists like myself to keep track of subatomic particles. And don't forget, we physicists also invented television. We invented radio, microwaves, radar. In a hospital, we invented the x-ray machine. And we invented the MRI scan. And don't forget, we also invented the space program and the GPS satellite. And we physicists love to make predictions. When we helped to assemble the internet, one physicist predicted that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. <laughs> well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> now, before I give you a guided tour of the future, as told to me by 300 of the world's top scientists, let me tell you a cautionary story. Over 200 years ago, we had the great French Revolution. And one day, there were three gentlemen about to have their heads chopped off at the guillotine. There was a priest, a lawyer, and a theoretical physicist, just like me, about to have our heads chopped off. Well, they put the priest's head on the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yes. He said, yes. He said, God. God from above shall certainly set me free. Well, all eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before it hit the neck of the priest. <gasps> the crowd gasped. They had never seen this before. And so the crowd said, let the priest go. Today, God has spoken. And now let's see about the lawyer. Yes, they put the lawyer's head in the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yes, yes. Maybe the spirit of justice, justice shall set me free. All eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before he hit the neck of the lawyer. Well, this time the crowd went crazy. Dancing in the streets of Paris, people were saying, today God has spoken. Justice and mercy have spoken. And now let's see about that theoretical physicist. Well, they put the physicist's head on the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yeah, 
Yeah, I got some last words. And he said, you know, I don't know too much about God. I know even less about the law, but I do know one thing. If you look up, you'll see that the rope is stuck on the pulley. <laughs> and then he said, if you remove the rope, the blade should come down real good. <laughs> big mistake. Huge, big mistake. Well, the rope came down, the blade came down, and the poor physicist's head came down. And it just goes to show you that sometimes we physicists have to know when to keep our mouth shut. <laughs> Nonetheless, let me open now the mouths of 300 of the world's top scientists that I've interviewed for my national radio program, BBC Television, the Discovery Channel, and the Science Channel. In this book, Physics of the Future, I go 100 years into the future. What about robots, space travel, cancer research? What about the future of artificial intelligence? And in this book, I answer the question of all questions. The question that has haunted philosophers and theologians for thousands of years. And that question is, is there intelligent life on the Earth? <laughs> and their answer is obviously no. No intelligent life on this planet. Ever seen American television recently? <laughs> in this book, Physics of the Impossible, I go 500 years into the future. But we might have starships. We might have teleportation. Maybe even time travel. And I answer the question, what happens if you enter a time machine and you go back into the past and meet your teenage mother before you were born and she falls in love with you? Well, if your teenage mother falls in love with you before you're born, you're in deep doo-doo if that happens. <laughs> and in my latest book, Physics of the Future of the Mind, I talk about the digitization process. We are digitizing music, we're digitizing media, we're going to digitize medicine, and the next frontier to be digitized is the mind. Two years ago, we were able to download the first memory Memories can now be sent on the internet. This means that eventually the internet will change into BrainNet. BrainNet is the next stage in the evolution of the internet. When we send memories, feelings, emotions on the internet, teenagers will go crazy. Teenagers put the happy face at the end of every sentence. Why put a happy face at the end of every sentence? If you could put the emotion, the feeling of your first date, the senior prom, the first kiss on the internet. So watch for it, the coming of BrainNet, when we send memories, emotions, feelings on the internet. But today, we are talking about money. So let us first answer the key question of all questions. And that is, where does wealth come from anyway? If you ask a lawyer, where does wealth come from, they would say, that's easy, lawsuits. <laughs> you sue Peter to pay Paul. That's where wealth comes from. It's a zero-sum game. Well, lawyers eventually become politicians. And if you ask a politician, where does wealth come from, the politician says, that's easy, taxes. You tax Peter to pay Paul, a zero-sum game. Well, I'm a physicist. We believe that you simply cannot rearrange wealth. You have to create wealth. And wealth comes in waves. The first wave of science and technology was the steam engine. We physicists in the 1800s worked out the thermodynamics of steam. We could calculate how many joules of energy you get from a lump of coal. And that set into motion the locomotive. All of a sudden, we had steam engines, factories, producing enormous amounts of goods and services. 80 years after that, we physicists worked out the theory of electricity, magnetism, and the internal combustion cycle. And that gave birth to the electric revolution. And then 80 years after that, we physicists worked out the third wave of wealth generation, high technology, transistors, lasers, all the wealth of the space program and telecommunic telecommunications. 
Now the question for today is, what is the fourth wave? The first wave was steam power. The second wave was electricity. The third wave was computers and transistors. What is the fourth wave of wealth generation? I say the fourth wave is artificial intelligence, biotech, and nanotech. Science at the molecular level. So let's now analyze how the fourth wave of wealth generation is going to ripple through society and change everything. First of all, the internet. Realize that chips are getting cheaper every year because of Moore's law, which says that computer power doubles every 18 months. Eventually, chips will cost a penny. That's the cost of scrap paper. Garbage will cost more than computer chips. So the internet will be everywhere and nowhere. Already in the operating room, physicians can use the internet to download x-rays, download MRI scans, download information. That's today. In the future, they will talk to the internet. The internet will gradually become intelligent. Artificial intelligence, so that in the operating table, the doctor can have a conversation with the internet, with the intelligence in the internet. And of course, who's pioneering much of this technology? I mean, after all, who invented the internet? The internet was not invented by Al Gore. <laughs> the internet was pioneered by DARPA, the Pentagon. And DARPA is not standing still. Already, DARPA wants to put the internet in the eyepiece of every soldier. So soldiers simply have to blink and they will be online. And so we're talking about a new era. First of all, of virtual reality, where you put on goggles and see, you can see a movie. Children love virtual reality. But augmented reality, where you can actually interpret what you are seeing. And beyond that, beyond augmented reality, is artificial intelligence. When you'll be able to talk to expert systems, argue with them, exchange notes with expert systems. In other words, you will have a companion on the operating table, a companion when you design spaceships, a companion that has expert knowledge. And of course, there's a problem with goggles. They give you seasickness, because what you see and what you feel, there's a mismatch. So we want to put the internet inside your contact lens. So who are the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. <laughs> College students of the future will blink and see all the answers to my exam right there in their contact lens. This is going to revolutionize education. Professors will no longer be able to require students to memorize the periodic chart of elements, to memorize the amino acids, to memorize all the details of science and technology. These internet contact lenses can also recognize people's faces. And when you speak Chinese, they will translate Chinese into English at the same level of accuracy as a UN translator. That is how accurate translation programs are becoming. When you see somebody, you'll see their biography right next to their name. How often have you bumped into somebody at a conference like this? You bump into somebody, and you say to yourself, I know this person. Jim, John, Jake, I know this person. In the future, your contact lens will say, it's Jim, stupid. You see him every year at this conference. And here's his complete biography right there in your contact lens. And tonight, you're at a cocktail party. And there's some very important clients at that cocktail party, but you don't know who they are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. <laughs> so we will live in a world of virtual reality, conjuring up images of things that don't exist, augmented reality where things are annotated. You understand who you're talking to, what you're talking about, and artificial intelligence where you'll be able to talk 
talk to the internet, expert systems that access expert knowledge. So in some sense, it'll be sort of like Star Trek, where you walk into the hologram and you see a whole new world erupt right in front of you. So in the future, you'll always know who you're talking to, what you're looking at, you'll be able to access information and bounce ideas off the internet. So what about your cell phone? Well, the cell phone, of course, will be pivotal in all of this. First of all, why do we have to have PCs, laptops, tablets, and cell phones? Well, they have a different size screen, that's why. Well, why not have a screen that's adjustable? This is the cell phone of the future, where you can scroll out e-paper, intelligent paper, and scroll out as much paper as you want. You can create a screen as big as you want, because we physicists can make paper intelligent. In fact, we can make yards of this stuff. This is the future of your wallpaper. Wallpaper will become intelligent in the future, because chips only cost a penny, as I said. Today, if your wallpaper is old, discolored, stained, ratty looking, what do you do? You suffer, that's what you do. In the future, you just go to the wall and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, please change color, please change size. In other words, you'll be surrounded by wall screens. On the Super Bowl, you'll be right there on the 50-yard line as the football goes whizzing right overhead. And then let's say it's 4 o'clock in the morning and you feel a pain in your chest. Is it a heart attack? Or is it the pizza you had last night? What are you going to do? Are you going to wake up the whole house and say, I have a heart attack? Or are you going to go to the wall and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. I want to see RoboDoc. Boom. RoboDoc appears in your wallpaper. RoboDoc looks human, but is not. It's artificial intelligence, accesses the entire medical literature, speaks ordinary plain English, and almost for free, almost for free, gives you sound medical advice. And then when RoboDoc wants an MRI scan, instead of having to make an appointment a month in advance at the local hospital, You'll go to your medicine chest and take out your portable MRI scanner. We physicists invented the MRI scan. The smallest MRI machine you can build according to the laws of physics of today is this big. This is the size of the world's smallest MRI scan, built in Germany. And Scientific American interviewed the Germans who built it and asked them, how small can you make an MRI machine? And they said, according to the laws of physics, the smallest MRI machine we can make is this big. In your cell phone, you will have more computer power than a modern university hospital. You will take your MRI machine out of your medicine cabinet and scan yourself. And let's say you're driving in a car in a foreign country and you're in a car accident and you gotta talk to a lawyer real fast. You're in a strange land. You don't speak the language. You don't know any of the laws. What do you do? You talk to your wristwatch and talk to RoboLawyer. RoboLawyer is inside your wristwatch. It's artificially intelligent, speaks any language, and understands the local codes in every country. RoboLawyer will get you out of a jam. And then the next question is, how will all this affect society? Let me give you the good news and the bad news. The good news is, this means that society will be cheaper, things will be more efficient, smoother, seamless, frictionless. The friction of society will be eliminated. That's the good news. What's the bad news? The bad news is pretty awful. The bad news is, in the future, we will have lawyers. Why is that? Because only a lawyer can talk to a jury. Only a lawyer can talk to a judge. Only a, ju only a lawyer knows the changing mores of society. Robots do not. 
We forget that robots are adding machines. They're very sophisticated. They can add a million times faster than us, giving us the illusion that they are thinking and that they are conscious. Actually, they're not at all. And so then the question is, how will this ripple through society? Let's say you're an investor and you want to know what's happening with a certain stock, which goes up and down, up and down, and you're clueless to understand why. What are you going to do? You're going to go to your wristwatch. You're going to go to your contact lens and say, I want to talk to robo-investor. Robo-investor scans the market, understands all the literature concerning one particular stock, and tells you why it's going up, why it's going down. And then you ask it, make a prediction. Doesn't have to be accurate, but what is your best judgment as to whether it's going to go up or down? Well, robo-investor has a few algorithms, and it makes a prediction. Of course, you don't have to accept it, but what is happening is you now get expert advice, something to supplement your own intuition. And let's say you're a developer, and I live in Manhattan. When I walk down the streets of Manhattan, I see all these skyscrapers. I don't know who owns them. I don't know how much they're worth. I don't know what the property value is. I don't know what the property tax is. I don't know the codes, the regulations. In the future, as you walk down the streets of Manhattan, robo-developer will scan the skyscrapers, identify each one, tell you who owns it, tell you how much it's worth, tell you what the property tax is, tell you what the regulations are, and tell you, is it on the up and up, or is it on the decline? So in other words, artificial intelligence will make a first guess as to what property values will look like in the future. And if you want to renovate it, if you want to buy it, renovate it, you will ask robo-developer, what will it look like if I develop it? What's your estimate as to what profit margin I will make? It'll make a first guess. And as we mentioned, if you are a doctor, you have all this information Medical information changes every week, every month. New breakthroughs are being made. How do you keep track of all this? Well, you talk to RoboDoc, and RoboDoc scans the medical literature and gives you an independent diagnosis. Now, will this replace the doctor? No. Ultimately, you want a doctor with experience, know-how, savvy. You want a doctor who's been through it many times, not simply RoboDoc. So we'll still have doctors, we'll still have lawyers, but they'll use these as aids. And then if you're a banker, you're flooded with mortgage applications, flooded with loan applications. You have to sift through piles and piles of data and then make an analysis. Well, RoboBanker is right there in your contact lens. Artificially intelligent, helping you to analyze trends, helping you to analyze, is this person credit worthy or not? And robo-lawyer will also be able to access the medical literature. So in the future, we will have lawyers, but will we have paralegals? And the answer is probably no. There are going to be winners and losers in this game. And one of the losers will be people involved in middlemen work, people who shuffle do documents and are basically human search engines. They could be pushed out in the law firm of the future. And what about robo-engineer? Let's say you're an engineer in a machine shop, and all of a sudden something breaks down. Normally, you'd have to identify the part that broke down, call the company, and then make arrangements to have it shipped out as soon as possible. It may take weeks. In the future, you will scan your machine that broke down, robo-engineer identifies the part, and instead of, instead of asking for it, it manufactures the part on demand. 3D printers can now print metal, not just plastic, but 3D printers are now beginning to print metal. In fact, see those shoes there? Those shoes were made on the spot. They were made by a 3D printer in a shoe store. So you don't have to wait for that designer shoe you can have the designer's shoe manufactured as you wait 
in a shoe store. So we're going from mass production to mass customization. And then if you're a robo-architect, if you are an architect, you'll be able to wave your hands, move parts of the design, and you'll immediately know the building codes, you'll immediately know the stresses and strains on your design, you'll immediately have access to as much information as you want if you are robo-architect. And what about the chauffeur of the future? Well, Silicon Valley has set aside the year 2020 to have the driverless car. Not only that, but the driverless car will become a robot. I say that the robotics industry will eventually become bigger than the automobile industry of today. We're gonna to have thousands of people involved with designing, machining, repairing robots. In fact, your car will become a robot. You'll argue with it. You'll talk to your car, and the car will park itself. One of the annoyances of having a car in Manhattan is having to park it. In the future, you'll talk to your wristwatch and tell your car, park yourself. The car then scans parking lots and parks itself. In fact, in the future, this could affect insurance rates because people will get into fewer car accidents. And people may not want to own a car in the future. They may simply want to lease it by simply talking to their wristwatch and saying, I want a car in another hour, rather than having to park it and worry about it all the time. So the robotics industry may become bigger than the automobile industry of today. But there's some people who say, wait a minute, isn't this dangerous? I mean, won't these robots turn against you? Robots that can be a cook on the right, robots that can be a nurse, robots that can play the trumpet, robots that can greet you when you check into a hotel. These are the robots built in Japan. Japan, first of all, has a vested interest in creating robots because Japan is aging faster than any country on the planet Earth. Japan loses a third of a million people every year. By mid-century, the Japanese population will contract at the rate of one million people per year. That is the official estimate of the government. Europe is next. Germany, Austria, Switzerland, they're gonna to start to contract as Japan is contracting now. But some people say, what happens when these robots decide to turn on us? Well, there's a debate between two billionaires. We have on one side, Mark Zuckerman, who says that artificial intelligence is great, it's gonna create prosperity for everyone. And on the other side, we have Elon Musk of SpaceX and Tesla Motors, who says, wait a minute. These pose an existential threat to humanity. In other words, some people fear that one day our creations will put us behind bars and throw peanuts at us and make us dance behind bars, just like we make bears dance behind bars of today. Well, I was on CNN on the Richard Quest show, and Mr. Quest asked me the question, who's right, Zuckerberg? or Musk. And I said, well, actually, both are right to some degree. In the short term, for the next many decades, until probably the late in the century, for many decades, Zuckerberg is right. There are billionaires waiting to be minted. New industries, new productivity, new visions created by artificial intelligence, which I claim is the fourth wave of wealth generation. But in the long term, let's face it, in the long term, eventually, these robots could become dangerous. Right now, Asimo on the left, you see here, is one of the world's most advanced robots. Asimo can run, walk, climb up stairs, and dance. In fact, it dances much better than me. I've been on several programs with Asimo. But on BBC television, I interviewed the creator of Asimo. And I said, look, your creation is one of the most advanced robots in the world. How smart is the world's most advanced robot? And he was quite honest. 
He said, I paraphrase, he said his creation, Esimo, has the intelligence of a cockroach, a retarded cockroach, a stupid retarded cockroach. It can barely run across the room. It cannot find mates. It cannot hide. It cannot do things that cockroaches can do. But one day, it will be as smart as a mouse. Then it will be as smart as a rat. Then it will be as smart as a rabbit. Then as smart as a cat, a dog, and eventually as smart as a monkey. At that point, they could become dangerous because they will have something that robots do not have today. What is the tipping point? The tipping point between Zuckerberg and Musk. The tipping point is when robots become self-aware. You see, the problem is robots do not know they're robots. You can go to our most advanced robot, slap it on its back, congratulate it for winning the chess contest, winning a go contest, and they're clueless. They're adding machines. They have the intelligence of a cockroach. But eventually, late in this century, they could become dangerous as they become self-aware. And at that point, we do have to worry about them. I should also point out that industry after industry is being digitalized. The next industry to be digitalized is transportation. These are supersonic transports. I was in Russia three days ago, speaking to the prime minister, and it took me nine hours to fly from New York to Moscow. In the future, I'll do that perhaps in one hour, because we will have supersonic transports for commercial airlines. Why don't we have supersonic Concords? Because of the sonic boom. The sonic boom killed the supersonic Concorde jet. But that's because we had computers of the 1960s. Conky robots of the 1960s designing airflow. Today, we have modern supercomputers that can model supersonic airflow. And then we can now create supersonic transports without sonic booms. So what am I building up to? I'm building up to something. All these creations and all these inventions, I'm building up to something. And that is the economy itself will be digitized and create something that I call perfect capitalism. What is capitalism? Capitalism is private ownership where prices are set by supply and demand. Period. End of story. That's called capitalism. But capitalism is imperfect. You don't know who's cheating you. You don't know what the profit margin is. You don't know how much things really cost. You don't know what other people are thinking. That's what we will get in the future. In the future, you go to a store. Your contact lens scans everything and tells you who's cheating you. What do things really cost? What is the profit margin on things? And so in other words, it eliminates the friction of capitalism. So hypothetically, if you want to become a billionaire the way that Jeff Bezos and others have done it, if you want to become a billionaire, here's how you become a billionaire. First, take an industry, any industry. Second, identify where there is friction where there is aggravation, where there's annoyance, where there are middlemen, redundancies, things that are unnecessary. Third, digitize it. That's what happened with Amazon. That's what happened with Uber. That's what happened with Airbnb. And it's going to happen more and more often. Digitizing the friction of capitalism. And who are the winners and losers? Every revolution has winners and losers. The losers will be repetitive workers, because those are the jobs that can be automated using robots. Next, middlemen. Middlemen because brokers are bean counters. That can be done by robots. Now, if you're a stockbroker, you realize that stockbrokers do not sell stock anymore. Now, you may say to yourself, that's stupid. Everybody knows stockbrokers sell stock, dummy. 
What else are they going to sell? Well, no. Stockbrokers don't sell stock anymore. You can buy stock on your wristwatch. So why do you go to a stockbroker? Because you want something that robots cannot provide. And that's the key to the whole puzzle. What do stockbrokers provide? They provide intellectual capital. They provide know-how, experience, savvy, innovation, creativity, analysis, leadership, none of which can be done by computers. And so if you are a middleman, if you are a broker, you have to add value to what you are brokering or you will go bankrupt. So let's now analyze the industries of the future and the present as to which ones are going to be digitized. And the question you have to ask yourself is, will my job be digitized? Will I be out of a job? I'm a professor. Will robo-professor put me out of work? Let's analyze that question. First of all, some jobs will not be replaced anytime soon. Believe it or not, gardeners will not be replaced. Robots cannot garden. Robots cannot pick up garbage. Garbage men will have jobs. Robots cannot fix toilets that leak. Plumbers will have jobs. Garbage men will have jobs. Policemen will have jobs. Because these are non-repetitive, semi-skilled jobs that no robot on the planet Earth can duplicate. Those people will have jobs. Middlemen may be out of work, but plumbers, how many robots can fix a leaky plum, a leaky toilet? You know, we have one place where a robot could change history, and that is at Fukushima. The United States Pentagon, DARPA, which pioneered the internet, created the Fukushima Challenge. It challenged scientists of the world to create a robot that can clean up the mess at Fukushima, but we have three melted nuclear power plants. Ideal space to highlight artificial intelligence. Well, almost every single robot failed. Robots cannot pick up garbage. Now, let's talk about the next big area to be digitized. We talked about music. Who controls the music industry today? <coughs> Apple computers through iTunes. The computer industry controls the music industry because the music industry failed to digitize. Media is now being digitized. In the future, it'll be medicine. Baby boomers are getting older and older. And so we're not talking about the digitization of the human body. First of all, we're going to digitize blood. In your blood are the hallmarks of cancer. Right now, in this room, in this room right now, some of you have cancer growing in your body. You don't know it. No test can tell you that. In 10 years' time, you may die of this cancer. Why can't we diagnose cancer today? Well, by the time you have a tumor, let's say you're a woman and you feel a tumor in your breast, they don't tell you this, but it's too late. By the time you feel a tumor in your breast, you have about 10 billion cancer cells growing in your breast. You are on the operating table. No ifs, no ands, or buts. You are on the operating table. In the future, we will have liquid biopsies. We'll digitize your blood, and your blood will tell you that we have fragments of cancer genes, fragments of cancer enzymes, cancer proteins in a colony of 100 cancer cells. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm saying is, in the future, the word tumor will disappear from the English language. In the future, we will no longer say the word computer. The word computer will disappear from the English language. The word tumor will also disappear from the English language because we'll detect cancer colonies 10 years before a tumor forms. Thanks to Silicon Valley, we have DNA chips and liquid biopsies. They're going to be commercialized starting next year. Ask your doctor. You could have cancer growing in your body right now and never know it for another 10 years before it's too late. And we will digitize the human body. 
This is an ear. It is made out of plastic. You seed it with your own ear cells, and your own ear cells grow into a perfect ear. We can now digitize bladders, skin. We can digitize noses, ears, heart valves. Complete windpipes can be grown from your own cells. In fact, the next major organ to be digitized is the liver. So for all you alcoholics in the audience, <laughs> you can drink up tonight knowing that we're hot on the trail of digitizing the liver. Even cartilage for baby boomers with aching joints can be digitized. We can now make unlimited quantities of cartilage. Even a beating heart. This is a mouse beating heart that's been digitized. And the next organ to be digitized, as I mentioned, is the mind itself. We physicists can look at blood flow of the brain and then calculate how thoughts go ricocheting in the brain. And we can now show that certain theories are correct and certain theories are incorrect about the brain because we can digitize the brain. For example, every parent in their heart of hearts, every parent believes that teenagers suffer from brain damage. <laughs> Absolutely true. It turns out that when scientists brain scanned the prefrontal cortex of teenagers, we were shocked to find that the prefrontal lobe is not fully developed. And that's why teenagers cannot evaluate risk that well. Also, another old wives' tale. When a man talks to a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. Absolutely true. They took many men in college, had them talk to a pretty girl, and they found that blood drained from the prefrontal cortex, and they started to become mentally retarded. <laughs> Absolutely true. We can quantify that effect now, and we can connect the brain to living I mean, exoskeletons. The military is pushing this technology for our veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. And in Japan, on the upper right, in Japan they even sell this commercially. It is a headband that detects brain activity with two ears on it. At a party, when you talk to someone who's very interesting, the two ears light up like this. But when you talk to someone who's boring, the two ears go like this, like that. So in Japan, you always know if you're gonna go home alone after the party. So we're talking about digitizing the human body. And memories, as I mentioned, can now be digitized. This is huge. This means that one day we will have a brain net that sends emotions and memories. On the left is the hippocampus. We now know in animal studies, in mice and in apes, we can digitize and record memories going through the hippocampus. Next will be Alzheimer's patients will be able to upload memories into Alzheimer's patients as they forget who they are, as they forget basic aspects of their life. In other words, in the future, we'll be able to upload memories. Now that's the basis of a Hollywood movie. There's a Hollywood movie called The Matrix, where reality itself was uploaded into the brain so that life was an illusion. So I'm winding up now, so let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a crazy question. Late at night, late at night, just before you go to sleep, have you ever had that weird feeling? That weird feeling that maybe life is an illusion? Just before you go to bed, have you ever had that weird feeling that everything around you is fake? That reality has been uploaded into your mind? You're the only real person but everything else in this is an illusion. Come on, be honest, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you ever had that feeling. Oh my God, you're crazy. <laughs> All you people think you're the only one in the universe? How can that be? I'm the only one in the universe. You know that I'm in New York right now? I'm just about to go to sleep. I'm in New York thinking that I'm before this great audience here in Las Vegas talking about the future. And let me also say that we can now photograph dreams. This is cutting edge research mentioned in my book. 
On the left, we can brain scan the human brain into 30,000 dots of blood flow. This is done at Berkeley, uh, where I got my PhD so many years ago. And by putting this through a computer program, we can construct a picture, a picture of what you are thinking of. On the top is Steve Martin, as he really is. And below that is a picture constructed by a computer program analyzing 30,000 points of blood flow in the human brain. Amazing. And then when you fall asleep, when you fall asleep, the machine keeps on going and prints a picture of your dream. So in the future, when you wake up in the morning, you'll push a button and perhaps see the dream that you had the previous night. And of course, do not show that dream to your wife. <laughs> anyway, let's wind up because I, I have to take questions and answers from the audience. Afterwards, I will be signing some books. And after that, you can go to eBay and auction them off for money. <laughs> so let me say a few things. First of all, every revolution has winners and losers. The losers are people who do repetitive jobs. Losers are people who do commodity capital, like perhaps agriculture. But the winners, the winners are intellectual capitalists, people who believe in the mind, creativity, experience, know-how, analysis, innovation, leadership. And so the point of my talk is very simple. You are among the winners. Congratulations. You are intellectual capitalists. You are people at the forefront of innovation, experience, knowledge, know-how, leadership, creativity. That is the currency of the future. And now let me just say a few things about myself, and then I'll wind up. When I was a child, I had a role model. My role model was Albert Einstein. And let me tell you my favorite Einstein story. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him, and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache. I will put on a wig. I will be the great Einstein. And you can put on my jacket and be my chauffeur. So Einstein loved the joke. So they switched places. This went along famously until one day. A mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you. And we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you very much. We have two microphones. So come on up if you have any questions about the future. Because after all, we'll only talk, we're only talking about your future. So come on up and ask some questions. Thank you so very much for a very enlightening and very entertaining presentation. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit uh, about humanity's ability to keep up with technology and to adapt to it. I mean, with these great ideas and technology racing ahead, um, maybe speaking to, uh, I guess in some cases, uh, the people's or humanity's difficulty in keeping up with all the things that we can do with these new capabilities. Well, if you want to keep up with the latest developments in this technology, talk to your children. Because your children probably have a much better understanding of this. Because your kids know this is my future. My future is invested in this technology. And these kids share the technology left and right with their own pals. And so that's the first thing you should do. Second thing you should do is realize that certain trends that are predicted may not come to fruition. For example, some people think that very soon robots will be smarter than us. Very soon. But there's a problem. That prediction is based on Moore's law that says the computer power doubles every 18 months. But they don't tell you this. Moore's law is slowing down. 
we see it now. You can talk to any physicist and they'll say, yes, Moore's law is slowing down. Why is that? Because a Pentium chip has a layer that consists about, of about 20 atoms thick at minimum. 20 atoms thick. That's the thinnest layer on a Pentium chip. But in five, 10 years, it'll be five atoms across. At that point, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle kicks in. You don't know where the electron is anymore, and it leaks. At the atomic level, silicon is unstable. So we are staring at the end of the age of silicon. A new age will dawn, the post-silicon era. Silicon Valley could become a rust belt, like the steel rust belt of old. Now, this is not going to happen anytime soon. It's still a decade or two away. But that's why I was in Moscow a few days ago, speaking to the prime minister in, Moscow, in Russia about quantum computers, that ultimately we may have to go to a new architecture, not anytime soon, but quantum computers, because we will exhaust the power of silicon. So anyway, just to keep up, talk to your kids. They're at the forefront of telecommunications, but also read some of the physics literature. We physicists realize that, well, we created this technology. We created it, but we also know the limitations of what we created. And so, and then the next question is, some people think that robots will become self-aware very soon. I don't think so for two reasons. One, Moore's law is slowing down. And second of all, consciousness turned out to be a lot more difficult than we thought. Now, in my book, I have a definition that I propose for consciousness. I personally think that animals are conscious. In fact, I would say that the unit of consciousness, one unit of consciousness, is a thermostat, one feedback loop. And the lowest level of consciousness is that of an alligator, that an alligator has spatial consciousness. Alligators understand their place in space. Beyond that, beyond alligator consciousness, beyond reptilian consciousness, is social consciousness, that of wolves, that of pack animals, that of mice, emotional animals, animals uh, in a society. And then the question is, what is human consciousness? If animal consciousness consists of spatial consciousness and social consciousness, what separates humans from animals? I say what separates human consciousness from animal consciousness is time. We constantly predict the future. Let's do an experiment. Go home tonight and teach your cat or dog the concept of tomorrow. Very soon, you'll realize that animals cannot understand tomorrow. They hibernate when it gets cold, but they have no understanding of yesterday, tomorrow, they live in the present. We are prediction machines. We constantly predict the future. And so before a robot like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie Terminator, before robots can take over, they have to do something that no robot on the earth can do, and that is predict the future. That's what the brain is for. The brain is a prediction machine. The prefrontal cortex predicts the future. The back end of the brain is the reptilian brain. It is the brain of instinct, of appetite, balance. The center of the brain is the monkey brain, the brain of emotions. The front of the brain is the brain that predicts the future. No robot can predict the future the way we humans scheme, we connive, we plan for the future. We can't help it. Every single second, we're constantly scheming about the future.